Hello and welcome to the JISC Psychology podcast series. I'm Dr. Keon West of the Institute of Psychological Sciences at the University of Leeds. And I'm here to talk to you today about whether or not psychology is really a science. All right, so to talk about whether or not psychology is really a science, I'll have to cover a few things first. I'll have to talk about what a science is. And of course, in doing that, I'll also have to talk about what a science is not. And then I'll talk about what psychology is. And then, of course, I'll have to also talk about what psychology is not. And then after that, I'll give you a few examples of what I do when I do psychology so that you understand how we do psychology, especially here in Leeds at the Institute of Psychological Sciences. If you look up the definition of the word science in multiple dictionaries, you'll get something that looks more or less the same as you go across them. I'll give you an example here. Um, that's science, a noun, the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. And the physical and natural is in brackets there because what I'm trying to emphasize is that yes, all we study is in the physical and natural world, but if there were any other worlds to study, you could study them scientifically as well. It's not limited to just the physical and the natural world. And again, we see a second one, systematic knowledge of the physical or material world gained through observation and experimentation. So science refers to that body of knowledge that you get through observation and experimentation. Those are the key words in that definition. Science is about knowledge gained through observation and experimentation. So if science is about knowledge gained through observation and experimentation, that means that science is about demonstration and justification. If in science you make a claim, so you make the claim that spending time with people from other groups makes you like those groups more, you have to be able to demonstrate that this is the case and to justify what you have said by backing it up with experimental data, any kind of observable, verifiable facts. Science is also about studying the world. So you can study anything that exists in any realm of reality or in any way, and you can study it scientifically. Science is also about testing hypotheses. So if you have a question, any kind of question that has an answer, science can give you a factual answer to it. And science, of course, is about increasing understanding. And this is very important. There is the perception among some that scientific views are stable. But of course, they're not stable. They can't possibly be stable. We're always increasing our understanding of the world. We're always increasing our knowledge. And with every new advance we make, we have to change our knowledge. And we have to change our belief set in accordance. So what is believed by scientists today should not be what is believed by scientists 100 years from now. We should always be making advances. In that light, we have to talk about a few things that science is not about. Because the hardest part for people when it comes to science is actually thinking scientifically. The easy part is getting the answers. But we often fall into traps that are not science and that people think are science. So science is definitely not about showing how smart you are. The public perception of science is definitely one of wearing a white lab coat, having a beaker, maybe a Bunsen burner, a fire, and a loud assistant. But that's not science. Anyone can buy a white lab coat. You can buy a white lab coat in Tesco's or in Argos. I own beakers and Bunsen burners. I don't use them because my science doesn't need them. But they're very easy to get. It's the thinking scientifically that matters. Science is definitely not about a mere belief set or a set of beliefs. It's not that scientists believe in this and non-scientists believe in that. Two people can believe the same thing but one of them can believe it for scientific reasons, and the other one could believe it for very non-scientific reasons. It's not what you believe that makes it science, it's why you believe it and whether or not you can demonstrate it. And finally, science is not about a specific field of study. So it's not the case that if you're looking at rocks, you're doing science, while if you're looking at emotions, you're not doing science. So long as you can make demonstrable claims about the thing you're talking about, you are doing science. That's the difference. To sum it up then, it would be fair to say that science is actually a system of methodology. It's a way of looking at the world and it's a way of gaining understanding. And science is definitely not a system of belief. It's not a set of things you're supposed to believe. It's a way of arriving at the things that we can believe or that we can understand. So for people today, students especially, they may be asking, 
well, what other path to knowledge have there ever been? Especially if you're growing up today, it might seem that science is the way that people get knowledge. But that's definitely not always been the case. In the past, actually, science hasn't been used at all, not the way that we understand it. And in many places today, it's still not. So what are the other paths to knowledge that people use or that people have used over the centuries? One would be revelation, which is the idea that a being that is more intelligent than yourself or has more authority than yourself can simply pass on the knowledge to you. It doesn't have to be in a religious or in a spiritual way, but that's the way that most people are familiar with. A deity or some other being that has more knowledge on the entire universe lets man know through some writing or through some revelation. A famous example of this would be Cardinal Bellarmine, whose name you've probably never heard, but he was the one who challenged Galileo Galilei, whose name you probably have heard, in that great debate about the movement of the planets. Galileo was saying, I'm looking at the planets. They seem to be moving around the sun. And Cardinal Bellarmine was saying, but we have been given revelation that says it is a sun that moves around the earth. And that was a great fight between scripture and observation, where Cardinal Bellarmine said, it has been revealed to me that this is true. But Galileo said, we are observing that that is true. You probably know how it ended, um, so I'm not going to spoil it for you if you don't. But I'm just pointing out that that was very important, and it was considered a legal precedent at the time. You could not challenge the revealed knowledge. Another path to knowledge is philosophy, and that's preceded the current scientific method by a very long time, thousands of years. A great example of using this method of arriving at knowledge, or getting to knowledge, is the French philosopher René Descartes, who tried to establish what could possibly be known by wiping everything off the table of knowledge and then seeing what he could most assuredly put back on. So just dealing with what he had, what could he logically derive and logically say was true? I'm not a philosopher. I think he got about as far as cogito ergo sum, which is, I think, therefore I am. So we know that René Descartes exists, or perhaps I know that I exist, or perhaps I don't. A philosopher will surely tear me to shreds if I try to explain this to them. But the point is not to evaluate these methods of understanding or gaining knowledge. It's not to compare them either. It's just to explain that they exist and that science is another method of gaining knowledge. It's one that I tend to prefer, partially because I'm a scientist and so I'm biased, but also because science has a great track record of producing tangible, demonstrable results that other methods don't necessarily have. So now that we understand what science is, it's a way of gaining knowledge through observation and experimentation, what then is psychology? And to understand what psychology is, you then have to understand that reality, as we know it, all of observable or testable reality is a pretty big thing. And as such, science, which is the study of all of observable reality, is also a pretty big thing. There's a conception that's passed around often seen in movies made in the 60s and 70s in which one person is a scientist. So in which there is a guy who is very intelligent who takes a microscope or a magnifying glass and he looks at science. You come to him and you say, doctor, I have cancer and the rocket ship's about to explode and he somehow manages to mix chemicals together and fix them. In reality, that's not the case. Science is a pretty big thing. To give you an example of that, I took the time out to Google last night the number of scientific papers published on chocolate since January 1st, 2011. It's currently April 2011. And I found 65 papers written about chocolate. Tiny number hidden there. It would be very, very difficult for a single human being to read all of the scientific papers on chocolate now, published this year. It would be absolutely impossible for a single human being to write the scientific papers about chocolate in a single year. And that's just chocolate. We're not talking about grand theories. We're not talking about huge experimental paradigms. We're talking about chocolate. So for one person to handle all of science would be impossible. The real picture of the interaction between the individual and science probably looks a lot more like that, where science is very big and you are very tiny.